Thank you for tuning in to an episode of InRange. This is the August 2020 Q&A. All questions provided by very amazing and incredible Patreon supporters. In fact, this channel, as you may already know, is completely decentralized in distribution. We're on multiple different distribution networks, not just YouTube, but also completely proactively demonetized. This means that YouTube didn't demonetize us, although they did to a degree, um, but I proactively demonetized us so that we would have no overlords, no advertising money adjusting or affecting the kind of content that's done on this channel. And I think that the content we're able to do here reflects that. And it is because of people like these Patreon supporters that enable us to do that. So thank you very much for each and every one of you. And if you'd like to consider it, just check us out on patreon.com. But there's lots of questions as always. Let me just go ahead and get the ball rolling. Justin. With the Surefire Enhanced Bolt Carrier Group in a full auto, what would Stoner do 2020 have special sauce potential? Well, Justin, thank you for spe specifying a full auto, what would Stoner do rifle, because I've seen this question a lot about a whole bunch of things, any AR-15 for that matter, or a standard traditional uh, standard uh, semi-automatic, what would Stoner do rifle? And the reality is the Surefire Enhanced Bolt Carrier Group, as I said in my review, really only has a positive effect in full auto application. It has absolutely no use, in my opinion, in any semi-automatic rifle. It just doesn't have any benefit. Um, it's not something that will do you any good except in a fully auto application. Now, that said, in a what would Stoner do build, if we're following the build properly per the uh, definition of what we believe is a what would Stoner do rifle, um, it would have a JP capture spring system in it, not a traditional buffer system. And that would not work or be compatible with the uh, Surefire Enhanced Bolt Carrier Group because the Surefire Enhanced Bolt Carrier Group has a weight in the rear which is intended to reduce or completely remove carrier bounce. But that also means that it has, um, that weight would prevent the guide rod in the uh, JP system from being able to go down the uh, center of the bolt carrier group, which would prevent it from being a viable alternative. So if we're going to go with what I believe is a completely true, what would Stoner do build, the enhanced bolt carrier group would not have benefit, or actually wouldn't work at all. Adam G, what do you guys believe is the best DMR ever fielded? Well, that's a loaded question because best is frequently sometimes subjective, and sometimes best is altered by historical uh, information. Like so, for example, a lot of people really think of this as not a DMR, but a lot of people think of the BAR as a incredible weapon. And you know, when it was first attempted to be fielded in 1918, it certainly had that potential. But by the time it was being used in large numbers in World War II, it was quite a bit behind the curve. But because of what uh, was achieved in the war, um, the the Browning automatic rifle is perceived as this amazing firearm, uh, even though it really wasn't by the time it was used in large numbers. So uh, DMR is going to have the same problems. But when I think of DMR, I think of two that really popped in mind as the best ever fielded. One is the SVD Dragunov. Now, a lot of you are going to go, that's a sniper rifle. Well, it's been pushed into sniper roles, but it wasn't intended to be. It was absolutely intended to be a DMR. Now, the Soviet definition of sniper and the American definition of sniper somewhat varies, but it was intended to be more of a DMR than any a specific sniper rifle. And the Dragunov absolutely is a contender for best ever fielded. The other one is one you're probably not going to think of. Um, and it was in the early 2000s, I think. Yeah, 2007, maybe? Well, I don't know if that's early 2000s, but 2007, right around there, there was a DMR program that was going on in the... Um, United States, maybe it was 20, 2005, I, I don't remember exactly, but around then, um, in which the M16A4 with an ACOG and a designated marksman program was being implemented, and there were training regimens that were being done at Camp Perry and other places by long-term competitive shooters, and that turned into quite a successful project in that um, in one battle, at least, if not others, there were so many achieved long-distance headshots on enemy combatants that uh, there was a brief war crimes tribunal kind of thing going on. They're like, is this execution? But it wasn't. Um, what it was was the incredible accuracy that the M16A4 with the right ammunition, which I believe at that time they're using the Mark 262 uh, with an ACOG on top, provided these DMR trained soldiers the ability to make incredibly accurate shots well outside the realm of normal reality that we normally see in those environments. So, uh, in my opinion, those are the two. The SVD Dragunov and the M16A4 ACOG DMR variant. Chatty PK. It seems to me that you do not particularly engage with other influencers, in quotes. Is it by design or unintentional? It's a little of both. Um, 
I, I guess you mean other YouTube content creators. Uh, the unintentional part is that, frankly, we don't have a lot of crossover of the content we kind of do. I do think that InRange is unique enough of a network, and our content is definitely unique in that regard, that um, I don't know that a lot of other content creators are exactly aligned with what's being done here. I'm not saying they're not aligned, but, you know, different emphasis and different things. Um, and then it is also somewhat by design. The reality is uh, a lot of people like the idea of collabs. Do a collab. Do a collab. And um, my experience is every collab I've seen, or maybe not every. That's a, for, you know, every time you use words every and all, they're wrong. But uh, most collabs don't actually seem to achieve what would think would be the expected goal. The expected goal would be that you'd have the uh, aggregate uh, viewership and subscriber base of both channels working together to um, increase the view count. And the reality is, it doesn't seem to happen. The few times we've done collabs, that's not happened. And um, I even kind of see that in other collabs that I see on other channels. So um, I would want to do them if they would be fun to do. Um, not necessarily for any other business or view type arrangement, if that makes sense. Um, the uh, It would be really cool, I don't know if you'll ever want to, but that Abtun Shea that I've shared here once that did um, does really great historical videos, mostly around the New Orleans area. He doesn't focus on firearms, but I think some sort of historical work with him would be really cool. I don't know if he's a viewer, but if you see that, hey, reach out to me. Christopher S. Any interest in mud testing a lightweight bolt carrier group that has gaps in the ejection port where mud might able to ingress? You know, that's true. Um, I've never done, of all the AR-15 mud tests we've done, and we've certainly done more than our share at this point because people just won't believe the results, We've never done one with a lightweight bolt carrier group. Now, for those of you that are not aware, the lightweight bolt carrier group concept is for, generally it's a match thing, it's a competition thing, and by getting the uh, bolt carrier group light enough that it's actually greatly reduced in mass, and then tuning the bolt, the buffer spring and the buffer and the gas system to be around that lightweight group, um, the uh, it allows you to have a very, very light recoil impulse. It also tends to make the gun less uh, reliable. So uh, it's very much about tuning the gun to be specifically for that application. And so uh, we have not done one with a lightweight bolt carrier group, and I think that would be worth doing as maybe the last AR-15 mud test, because I'm tired of AR-15 mud tests, to be completely honest, and it's been very it's become very obvious that we're not going to ever convince anyone about anything in that regard. Um, all it does is turn into fights about the AK is the wrong AK, it's not a real AK, uh, you guys are idiots and don't know what you're talking about, etc., etc. That said, the content we've already done stands on its own, and I think I stand by the results over and over and over again. So, the only two other AR-15 style mud tests that I think are coming to the channel, one I know is coming to the channel, I think this recommendation of a lightweight bulk care group makes sense, and I think that might happen. But of course, the most important one will be when we get the complete What Would Stunner Do 2020 build together, and we will absolutely do that for obvious reasons. Tim, what is an underrepresented area of history you'd like to see researched? Well, I think I've talked about this on the channel quite a bit, to be honest, and there's some content here and more to come, although historical videos are the hardest and longest to create, so patience is requested, and I apologize for that taking time. That said, they're also on the lower end of the view count, so maybe not a lot of you care that much. I'm not sure. But in terms of upper, uh, underrepresented, in terms of what I find worth talking about, is the confluence of civil rights and self-defense and firearms ownership. And, I mean, I mean, certainly you can see references here and there about this or that, but you don't see it done in an in-depth academic way, or even necessarily in a very educational way. You see just brief comments at best. And the reality is, a lot of that is verbal um, or uh, community known history and, and, and information and if you're not part of that community it's very hard to get some of that information. A lot, a lot of it's been put to to book and the reason for that is for their own protection frequently. Um, knowing things around your community that are there to protect you or you need to know about to keep yourself safe um, is privileged information and a lot of what happened during the civil rights movement with firearms except for the obviously legislative and legal elements is sort of like that. It's community knowledge. Now, some of that's been put to some books, and some of those books are quite excellent, and there is more of that coming to the channel. But in terms of it being uh, researched and represented, that would be something I would think would be very important to do. And, um, uh, of course, that is still an ongoing issue today. Bootstraps. In a time of so much frustration and isolation, what are you enjoying most now? 
road trips and being outside in weird remote places that don't have a lot of people if you can find them. So road trips done properly can be quite safe um, during COVID. And uh, I would say that get your mask and get in your car and go see something. Um, that's something I enjoy anyway, but now's the time to do it even more so. And some places have less people than ever. Now, if you go to urbanized areas like hiking spots, those things are densely packed and never mind that. And that's not my bag anyway. But if you go to remote areas, guess what? Still remote. Josh W., between 762 by 39, 545, and 556, what cartridge do you feel would be best in Kalashnikov USA's Civilian 100 series, assuming the context of two gun and spinners, etc.? This is going to be always controversial. I'm going to say the answer is always the same one, though. 5.56. Um, and the reason 5.56 is because 5.56 in this country has a wide diversity of ammunition, wide diversity of projectile types, and all sorts of things you can do with it in terms of its also inherent accuracy. Uh, 5.45 isn't being made in this country in, in large enough numbers to be worth considering. I know there's been some stuff, but it's not stuff you're going to buy for a match. You're not going to buy a thousand rounds of critical defense or something like that. At 7.62 by 39 is fine, but its ballistics don't lend itself well to the type of engagements you're going to find in two-gun or any competition environment, which are close targets and then far away targets. And it can be done, don't get me wrong, 7.62 by 39 could be competitive, but the reality is 5.56 would still be the best choice in this country, for sure. And there is nothing blasphemous about a 5.56 AK. With the right magazines, they're incredibly reliable, just as reliable as 5.45 or 7.62 by 39, with the difference of the cartridge not having quite a much, as much taper, but the reality is I have had a number of 5.56 Bulgarian Arsenal guns in my collection, including my one of my favorites, which is my Suchka, and uh, that thing has been has never failed. So, Philip W., could you show or demonstrate how much fouling occurs after 10 or 20 rounds in a firearm enough to cause issues? Um, I'm assuming you mean black powder, because... 10 to 20 rounds in a smokeless is not going to have enough fouling to ever cause an issue. And this is something I've had on my agenda to do. In fact, I even have a boar snake that I want to do some video with in that. So that is actually something on the plans. And um, I know that everything seems like it takes a long time, but guess what? It takes a long time. So yes, I am going to do that, and that is on the agenda. I don't even know if we'll get to 20, to be honest. Um, probably less. Craig S. Why no shotgun mud testing? Hmm. Absolutely no reason, except that I don't care about them that much. Well, not in the way that I think about them like I think rifles. So, uh, obviously you see some stuff behind me, and those are theoretically shotguns, right? But I never even thought about mud testing a shotgun. Um, I guess that's going to need to be done at some point. So, you're right. Good idea. Nyrom. Is there a move? Is there a more in-depth reviewer comparison of lever action rifles planned or in the works? I would like to see the downsides or benefits to Italian and Japanese reproductions. Yes, this is actually something I mentioned I would do. Um, at Desert Brutality 2020, before the pandemic really kicked into full swing, as you may or may not have seen or remember, I used a uh, Moroku Winchester, Japanese manufactured, um, 1873, to take the classic manual division. I won it with that. And um, when I compared it, at least off camera, to the Uberti equivalent, which is Italian, the Moroku Japanese had a couple historical deficiencies in terms of being correctly historically accurate, but in terms of general fit and manufacturer quality, the Moroku was quite a bit better than the Oberti alternative, and it's the reason I chose it for Desert Fatality 2020. So have I planned to do a comparison? Yes, I have. Will I do one? Yes, I will. Has it happened yet? No. And as I said earlier, everything requires a little bit of patience on this channel, but it will get there, and that is in the works. Alex, have you ever considered doing episodes on your favorite science fiction weapons, um, and whether or not they'd be usable or just for fun sort of thing? No, I haven't. Um, I'm actually a huge fan of film, and I'm a film buff, and science fiction is definitely one of the genres I really love. Um, horror and sci-fi is kind of my bag when it comes to film, although documentaries are huge too. Um, but I've never considered doing this because, frankly, I just don't care that much. Um, I don't really like playing in the fantasy land of stuff when there's so many real firearms to, to talk about and do work on, and so that would be so low on my list of priorities that it just doesn't register on my radar. Lekka. Revolving rifles never gained the same popularity as other repeating rifles of the 1800s. Was this only due to safety issues like chain fire or cylinder gap blast? And if so, do you think that the changes such as cartridges or a Nagant 
tight gas seal could have made them safer and thus more successful. Well, um, you're going to see content on this channel about revolving rifles. In fact, I have an 1860 Colt with a stock on it uh, for that purpose. And um, there's going to be a video about that. So um, there are a lot of deficiencies of the revolving, revol revolving rifle. And the reality was that it was kind of something we could do, but I wonder if it ever should have been done, but it certainly was better than not having a stock. And in fact, the early Berdan sharpshooters, believe it or not, before they got their sharps rifles, um, were armed with predominantly revolving rifles. Now, for those of you who don't know, it's essentially it's a black powder percussion revolver with a stock on it. But you can't handle it by putting your hand in front of the cylinder because gas leak from the cylinder gap between the actual cylinder and the barrel is an issue against your arm. But if you get a chain fire, which is a real thing, in which all of the, or some, or all of the chambers in a uh, percussion gun go off at once, um, that would obviously be a very bad thing to your support hand. Additionally, um, if something is slightly out of index, you'll get shrapnel and metal coming out of the front uh, when it's cutting the ball as it's going into the forcing cone, none of which is good to a support hand. Now, I can tell you, because I've done this off the clock, does a stock on a percussion revolver make it easier to use and more accurate? Oh, yeah. Um, you can actually make really good shots with that thing out to well past 100 yards, if not further. So I can see why they like they use them in the Berdan sharpshooters, but I can also see why they got rid of them as quickly as they could when they got sharps rifles that they could use instead. So do I think that a proper gas seal like a Nagant would, would have fixed the problem? It would have mitigated some of it? You see the modern day, uh, some of the... Uh, Taurus made some of these out of the Judge, I think, or, or equivalents there of the chamber in 45 Colt. And they put like a metal shield around the front of the cylinder to protect the shooter. That goes a long way, but the reality is you're really forcing a square hole into a round peg, in a, or a round peg into a square hole. <laughs> um, and uh, it doesn't, by modern standards, I don't see the value, and I don't think that there was any reason to continue down the developmental path of revolving rifles when other things came about. Jebedar. If you could pick a firearm other than the AR-15 to have the same proliferation and availability as the AR-15 in the U.S., which firearm would you choose? You know, I would have originally said the AK, because the Kalashnikov is an amazing firearm. But now that I've actually had some time and experience with, the, with as close to a legitimate G36 as I could, um, can, I would say the G36. Uh, the G36 is a really excellent platform that provides a lot of modularity and opportunity to be something more than it currently is. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would pick the G36. Milan S. How much of a safety risk or overall disadvantage or advantage are there between non and reciprocating bolt handles? What's the trade-off? Well, the uh, disadvantage of not having a reciprocating handle is that you can use the reciprocating handle to to manipulate the gun in ways that you couldn't otherwise. So it can be better in the instance of a malfunction. And yes, somebody here in the comments, as a forward assist. Now, I will still argue that you don't want to force a cartridge that does not want to go into the chamber under its against its will. You should open that up and get in there and clear it out and then try to chamber a fresh, clean cartridge. And therefore, forward assists and forcing things into battery is a bad idea in general. But that said, um, a non-reciprocating charging handle gives you more control over the bolt and the ability to manhandle, for lack of a better term, the gun when something's gone awry. Um, but it also means that it's cycling back and forth. A non-reciprocating charging handle, of course, means less mass moving during the cycle of fire, meaning that the gun is not recoiling as much because less moving mass is a good thing. Um, but it also means that it's harder to deal with the malfunctions should they occur. Um, I think the deficiency of a charge, a reciprocating bar, a charging handle is quite minimal. And the fact that people make a big deal out of this thing has a reciprocating charging handle, and that's a problem to me, goes right up there with, can I fire this with the stock folded? I don't really think it's that big a deal. And a reciprocating charging handle, if you were to allow it to strike your hand or some surface around you, could induce a malfunction, which you would not have with a non-reciprocating charging handle. But really, it's not a big deal. So... I don't think of reciprocating charging handles or non-reciprocating charging handles as a particularly important thing as long as it's done properly. Oh, I drink some of my coffee. I made coffee for today. Hmm, fancy coffee. Typically when I make coffee, I don't just make coffee. I make fancy coffee. So this is um, essentially a homemade cappuccino that was made um, in a... Yes, I got it out of a, of a second-hand store, a $20 machine. Uh, that is as simple as one could get, but it does the job. It puts steam through 
uh, espresso grounds, which makes your espresso. And then it has a little nozzle on the right that is a steamer that allows you to steam milk. And then you add sweetener, combine the two, and you have a cappuccino for $20. And if you look at places that are normally sell modern machines that do that, they're thousands of dollars. So it's crazy to me how simple the technology needs to be to make something like this and how much money people spend on making it. Let's see what we got here. Travis R. What do you advise someone who's interested in buying a transferable machine gun for the first time? Things you may not consider or lose sight of in the excitement of purchasing one. Well, it's a big investment. Um, I would uh, So one of the things I would think of is, can I use this enough to justify the cost? So let me show you an example of that. This actually comes back to Ian. When uh, a long time ago, Ian sold it ultimately, but Ian had a belt-fed, uh, was it a Vickers? It was a belt-fed Vickers, I believe. It was a belt-fed Vickers or Maxim, I can't remember call, but it was a giant beast of a belt-fed, full-caliber full, cal full caliber machine gun that sat on top of a complete mount with water can and all of the accoutrement that made it a great thing for suppressed fire on the battlefield of World War One, but it made it, all of those things made it a terrible thing for trying to actually enjoy or have fun shooting. Uh, it was literally a uh, crew serve weapon. It took you a lot of effort to get it out to the field, to set it up, to load it, to shoot it, and then put it back away. On top of that, once you started shooting it, guess what those guns do? They sit there on their tripod and go dot, 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 boringly reliably for as much ammunition as you can put into it, which is now turning a lot of money into noise, and you can't do anything else with it. You just kind of just spray fire into the field downrange and watch it kick up dirt. That sounds fun, right? And it is fun for about a minute, and then it's not fun anymore, and the reality is this is just boring and expensive. So um, I would, I would, and I think a lot of times when you look at like select fire rifles, those kind of fall into the same category. Um, so what I would think of is honestly, I think when it comes to owning as a civilian, a full auto transferable, some machine guns are where the bag is at for fun versus cost and, and general ammunition expenditure. And one that has the most expandability for everything you'd want to do makes the most sense. So obviously if you buy an MP40, maybe that's your bag and you really want an MP40, which by the way, I would love to have an MP40. But once you have an MP40, guess what you have? You have an MP40. You can't do anything else with it besides shoot it as an MP40. And this is the reason I went with a with a um, M11A1 with all the lage uppers and conversion kits because it turned it. I can take an M11A1 and turn it from a little machine pistol buzzsaw into eventually when it's released a full length 5.56 select fire rifle with lages conversion kits. So for the cost of one transferable, I get multiple different experiences and guns. Plus, I can use it in match and, and competitive environments or in the field, and it doesn't require any special gear or stuff to be able to go out and use it. I just literally pick it up, get some magazines, and go shoot. So I would make, unless you have a very specific historical interest, like I want this thing, only that thing, I would look at that as your um, one of your very important considerations. And I would say that crew served thingies on tripods with belts, you will find that they get boring pretty fast, quite honestly. Turbo, 1889. What handgun setup would you suggest for carrying a restrictive environment where semi-auto and or swappable magazine fed is prohibited? Um, I actually have one, uh, which I really like. I don't know if they still make it, but there would definitely be equivalents thereof. Um, and I, I got grief for it, which I don't understand why anyone would give me grief for my dyslexia in this regard. But um, the uh, Smith & Wesson Performance Center 8-shot 357 is an amazing uh, revolver that is extremely light, easy to handle, and carries 8 shots with wound clips, which makes it very fast to reload, almost as fast as a semi-automatic. So I would look at, in that regard, that's probably the best of breed in that regard, but what I would look at is a wheel gun chambered in 357 that would be my thought um, although other options can apply but then also ensure that it has it's been um, shaved for moon clips so that for quick reloads and you've really got not as good as a semi-auto but you have the ability to reload that not that far away from the capabilities of a semi-automatic magazine fed pistol so um, that would be my recommendation Kevin B what is one real-world variable that you wish could be included in a practical shooting environment that you haven't figured out yet? Lack of an emphasis on time. Um, it would be really, I, we see this all the time with, with competition videos. We're like, you're not using cover, you're not using real tactics, you're, therefore this is just a game. Well, first of all, 
If you're saying that, then every form of training that isn't a specific combat training is just a game, right? Well, that's false. We know that marksmanship and all those things apply, and time and um, being able to perform well with accuracy under time, stress, and duress is an important thing to learn. Uh, but what's also important to learn is tactics and cover and concealment, etc. It would be really cool to be able to actually enforce cover and concealment restrictions on a course of fire. And people have tried to do this in the past. You see this with IDPA. We tried to do it at some point with some of our two-gun stuff. The reality is it's absolutely unrealistically unenforceable. Having things like, you must be behind this line, people will find a way to defeat it, or they won't step over the line, or whatever. None of this works, and IDPA became this thick Bible of a rule book trying to enforce tactical concepts. Now, the other problem with that is you're enforcing one perspective on tactical concepts, and maybe that's not even the right one, or things change over time, and you need to be dynamic. So the best we can do is design stages that implement things that kind of force you to do things like we present a barricade that you have to shoot around from a box and you don't have a choice really but to change support side left shoulder, right shoulder to be able to get around the barricade but we don't dictate it per se in the actual coercive fire or penalties thereof as a result. But if it was possible to reduce the emphasis on time and increase the emphasis on actual tactical sound actions, that's what I'd like to see. Can't figure it out? Tried for years. Joe S. What are your thoughts on side-mounted mounted, side mounted magazines like the FG-42 and a modern rifle? I don't have any thoughts against it. Um, I just think it's, it's a little awkward and people aren't used to it. And we know that for the most part, people are creatures of habit. And trying to change what is considered the normal modern methodology of a magazine placement will be inevitably met with disaster and failure in the market. So even if it had an advantage, the chances of someone actually willing to try it are quite low because they will fail just on the basis of it being weird and different. Um, that said, I have shot FG-42 extensively and the side mounted magazine has some advantages. It doesn't really send the weight of the gun off that much. It doesn't tilt that badly. It really isn't that big a deal. It reduces the overall weight and length of, well, not weight, but length of the gun so that it's not a bullpup, but bullpup-ish. Um, and you have the ability to visibly, visibly be eyes on where the magazine is when you're doing a malfunction or a feed. I think it actually has a lot of advantages, but we're not going to see more of it. Matt C. What are your thoughts on Steel Challenge as an intro to competitive shooting? So for those of you that don't know, Steel Challenge is pretty much a static shooting environment. There's usually a box or maybe three boxes or something like that. And plates downrange at relatively close-ish ranges, maybe 10 to 25 yards. I think there's some that go up to 50, I don't recall. They're all very much, these stages are always exactly the same. And there's like, I think, eight of them. I'll, I might be wrong, it's been a little while. But you'll go to a match and they'll shoot four of them. You go to another match and they'll shoot the other four. Um, but what it is, is you stand in a box and stand and deliver. Buzzer goes off, you draw, and you engage four plates and the stop plate. Ding, 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 bink. And then you do that multiple times. Ding, 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 bink. Ding, 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 bink. And then they drop the worst time and give you the, and then aggregate the other four or whatever it is. Um, it's a very static environment, a very calm, safe environment. And I would say that for, as an intro to competitive shooting, I think it's actually an exceptionally good choice. Um, you are, if you're using it, doing it properly, you're drawing from a pistol, you're getting used to being on the clock, you're not moving or running with the gun, but you are doing stuff on, under time, stress, and duress with people watching you. And it's about the safest version of a thing you can do to get your, your um, feet wet in that environment. So if you're thinking about it, and you should start off someplace simpler than someplace harder, you shouldn't just come to two gun. So I would advise you, if of all the ones I could think of, Steel Challenge would be a really excellent one to choose. So I think that's a good idea. Christian S. I was recently re-watching your video, 1918 Sturmtruppen versus Real Line Landwehr. Will there be any more videos like this comparing equipment or soldiers in the future? Probably, yes, but I have to find people that are willing to do it. So what I mean by that is Ian's still around and he's still part of the channel, but the reality is his travel with Forgotten Weapons and his schedule has become... Um, I don't know how to put this in any other way but then absurd. I would, um, I think I would rather shoot myself than do what he's doing, but hopefully he's enjoying it. That says his availability to be around to do content like that is minimal. In fact, his ability to attend matches anymore has gotten down to be like two to three a year. Uh, so uh, that's difficult to plot out. And when he comes to the match, he normally has something he needs to do because that's the rare opportunity to get footage on the clock. I'm not saying it won't happen. But what I am saying is it would be nice to be able to find some other people to also do similar things with. And if you're one of my shooters and you think that you would be a candidate for that, um, let me know because I would love to have 
uh, more of that kind of stuff. As for Sinister Rifleman, he has said he will be willing to shoot some weird guns on the clock as long as it's a second run. He's not really interested in shooting that as his primary match experience because matches for him, while he obviously does videos for in range as well, are his uh, form of entertainment and relaxation. And bringing out a weird gun that doesn't work on the clock is inverse to his goals of having fun. But if he could shoot twice, he could shoot the second stage and we could do verses on that as well. So, yes, there will be more. Um, We'll see who, and if you're one of my normal two-gun shooters or brutality shooters and you find that you would be interested in that and also feel like you'd be a good presenter on camera, because that's an important skill as well, let me know and maybe we could get something figured out. So I guess maybe that's a uh, job opening. Um, three lock. How do you approach a match that's new to you? I read the rules and I show up. Um, and then I watch, don't shoot first, and watch people around me and try to fit into whatever the environment is. Um, and every place, every match, every match style has its own culture. Yes, it really does. If you go to a cowboy action shoot, there's a different culture than going to a two-gun shoot, which is a different culture than going to a USPSA shoot, which is a different culture than going to a three-gun shoot. It really has different mindsets and different kinds of people in some regards, and very few cross over. So check out the culture, feel out the vibe, try to, I don't want to say fit in, because I never do anywhere I go, so I gave up on that a long time ago. But don't try to stick out and get through it and be safe and sane and see if it was fun or not. Give it one or two tries and then decide if it's for you. Gary, why? If you could eat only one type of cheese, what would it be? Really high quality Swiss. I love Swiss cheese. Although I love others too. Blue cheese is up there. Um, gosh, I need some of my coffee. Blue cheese is up there. Um, yeah, but Swiss. Really high quality Swiss would be the winner. Tom B. I know you guys tested Magpul's D60 for the What Was Done project, but have you all thought about bringing out the Surefire 60 or the newish ATI Schmeisser 60 round? I haven't really played with the Schmeisser at all. I can't speak to that. Um, we did do content about Surefire, and you know why they're not on YouTube? Because YouTube restricts that. Now, I know other people do it, and I hope they get away with it, but I'm not willing to risk uh, my body of work on this network for that. We would have to put it on other channels. And when we put specifically non-other content everywhere else but YouTube, guess what happens? They don't get seen. Not really. Um, a video that'll get 30 to 40,000 views on YouTube, even with a redirect on any other distribution network, gets two to 3,000. So to put in the time and effort to do content that can't show up on this network, on the primary channel network, is difficult to justify. And that is indeed the cooling effect that happens with policies like what YouTube does. It means it puts some boundaries around what's viable to do to make sure people actually freaking see it. Now, if I do proprietary content and put it on another channel, um, I would I have done that. There is some of that out there, and there will be more of that. But putting a dedicated effort into that to do it somewhere else is problematic um, in terms of people actually seeing the work. And while Patreon is the only, well, viewer support is a better even way to put it, is the only way that this channel supported, the reality is if people don't see the work, it's still a disappointment, right? So. Um, that said, have we tested the Surefire in the past? I have. The one I got from the store didn't work. I had ma constant malfunctions with it, and that was around the time that I got to meet Jim Sullivan himself, and he gave me one of his personal Surefire mags. I have it in my magazine collection. It's got his writing on it. I got Jim Sullivan's magazine. That one worked great. So I've had one that worked great and one that did not. Uh, I don't know about the Schmeisser, and I have played with 60 round mags or whatever, the 50 round mags for the AK, and I have problems with that too. I'm pretty soiled on the whole concept of a quad stack magazine, um, but I can't say that the D60 drums have worked reliably. So does the Schmeisser not work? I don't know. I guess maybe we'll have to figure that out at some point. I'm sure I'll get my hands on one. Uh, maybe I'll do it as a Patreon-only video. That makes more sense when it comes to proprietary content that can't be on YouTube. Zachary L. Do you think the attempted revitalization of 545 in the U.S. will be enough to make importers to bring in more Balkan AK-74s? I don't know that there is an attempted revitalization of 545 in the U.S., and the only revitalization I see of 545 would be more masked in produ production or mass production or uh, importation of a, a wider variety of quality 545 ammunition. The 545 ammunition on the market, besides the occasional military surplus, which is now extraordinarily expensive, is relatively medium to bottom tier quality in terms of its general mechanical accuracy, and it provides deficiencies to that platform that shouldn't be there. Uh, but it is what it is. So if you want to shoot a 5.45, you're going to shoot ammo that's not that great. 
uh, it works. It's reliable. It's just not all that accurate. And I think 545 can be wildly accurate. So, um, I don't know. I think 545 in this country is a bit of a non-go, a, non a non-starter. Do any of you do any hunting of any kind? And this is Carl, Ian, or Russell. Um, I can answer for all of us in this regard, although Ian's not here. Russell doesn't. I don't think he ever has. Maybe he has, but if he has, it's been so long, he doesn't even talk about it. Um, I have. It's been a long time for me. Um, I didn't particularly enjoy it that much. It's kind of boring, and uh, I'm really not into shooting animals that much, to be honest. Uh, but if I needed to, I would. I'm not saying I would not hunt an animal if I needed to eat. And I'm not saying I'm against hunting. But don't that do not misinterpret that. It's just not something I enjoy. Now I've done a bunch of dove hunting, quail hunting, javelina. Um, I know how to. I've I've glassed. I've killed game. I've skinned, gutted all the things, um, and I learned how to do it because I wanted to have it as a life skill more than I wanted to do it as a hobby. Turned out it just isn't for me. I didn't really enjoy it very much, so I I just don't. Um, if I needed to, I would. And uh, kudos to those of you that find it to be an incredible uh, something that you enjoy and experience because. Um, Quite honestly, the animals that are harvested from the field when done properly had a much better life than anything that came out of the farm industrial complex. So there's no moral issues there for me. I just don't enjoy it. Um, Ian does uh, intermittently. He goes on hunting trips and has set up, I believe, a um, Steyr Scout setup specifically for his hunting endeavors. I think he's done some content on his channel about it, but um, Ian does and he enjoys it. So cool. David, will the What What's Done or Do 2020 be as soft shooting as the original SB1 was? Or is it more overgas? Excuse me, like newer carbines. Um, well, remember, the original SP-1 or the original AR-15 had a 20-inch barrel. And it is a very soft shooting rifle. And I would be lying to you if I said that what would Stoner do 2020 is as mildly recoiling as an original SP-1. It does kick a little more. It's also extremely light and shorter. Um, and sometimes we're shooting heavier cartridges or heavier projectiles, like 77s, etc. So is the What Would Stoner Do build um, as soft recoiling as the original SP-1? I would say that when you do it properly and build it with all of the specifications that we've specified, including the JP Capture Spring, which really does matter, um, it's darn close. Is it as light shooting as the SP-1? No, I don't think it is. But it's very close. Miss Galieva. In a situation where you know your enemy has just as good an abundant night vision as your own, that's a reality, it's definitely here and coming, would you say that mounting a weapon-mounted night vision is actually more practical than just accepting the struggle of trying to view the through the optic with a head-mounted unit? Oh, absolutely. Um, so first of all, if you know that your opposition has the same level of um, night vision equipment and capabilities that you do, the things that we typically do nowadays with IR lamps and IR lasers are an extremely bad idea because it goes directly back to you. So that's a two-way street. It's like a tracer, right? You set off your IR laser, someone off in the distance also has night vision, and guess what your IR laser is? Aligned to you, the shooter, or the enemy. Um, I argue that we're going to see a resurgence, or a need to see a resurgence, if not already are and maybe don't hear about it, about um, night vision units being mounted to the weapon behind the optic so that you are passive versus active in terms of night vision. And um, one of the things that uh, certain optics are better than that for others, like the EOTech. And do I think that, uh, and you can kind of cant with a head-mounted unit through some rather high optics and kind of get something, but it sucks. Um, I, I would say that perhaps the advantage would be one of both. Um, off maybe this is conjecture so if you guys have experience otherwise I'm willing to hear it this is just me thinking out loud right now um, having a head mounted single eye unit on the left and then having a weapon mounted unit to go with your strong eye or vice versa um, sounds like an interesting solution mm. uh, but you definitely we are definitely getting more and more to a point where passive night vision is going to be necessary otherwise um, no good umbrella cop mm. Um, I talked to Lugerman personally at a gun show and asked him why he had never seen why we had never seen one of his 10 millimeter Lugers. He said it was because no one ever bought one. They vary in price between nine thousand and thirteen thousand dollars. Now why you? Would this be an endeavor ever worth taking for the channel? Could Patreon ever fund it? You would be paying for the production of the first 10 millimeter Luger ever, which in my opinion would be the most historical monument, far better choice than something like another anti-material rifle or three custom ARs. I actually agree. Now. I think 10 millimeter is kind of a meme. People really meme out on that cartridge and think that it's something it isn't. It is a very powerful, potent cartridge. Um, would it be really cool to have a reliable 10 millimeter Luger? Well, I mean, Luger is an is a is a obsolescent design by modern standards, right? Let's just be realistic. Um, but 
uh, you can get a 10 millimeter thing that's far better with like 16 rounds or 15 rounds or 13 rounds or whatever it is. But um, would it still be ridiculously cool to have a 10 millimeter Luger? Yeah. Would it be even cooler to have the only 10 millimeter Luger? Absolutely double. Yeah. Now, am I going to spend um, out of the Patreon funding to keep this channel alive? Can I afford to spend thirteen thousand dollars to get one made? No, I can't. Um, so, uh, you open this door, sir, and um, I, I would not have opened it because I don't like asking people to do this. Um, if you in the audience thinks that that would be worth doing, let me know because this would be a crowdsourced endeavor, and ultimately the pistol would land up as in-range property, so you'd be buying in-range a $13,000 unicorn pistol. Um, I don't really want to ask you to do that, so if you in the audience think that is worth doing, tell me, um, especially on Patreon. If you're already a Patreon supporter, let me know, because that, that feels like double dipping, and I don't really want to do that to these people that support this channel and keep it alive. But if you think that would be worth the effort, for a couple videos or recurringly seeing it in match videos, which it would happen, um, let me know. Um, I'd be up for that. Um, but I also want you to understand that I'm only telling you this under the context of someone asked the question. Don, how do you adjust for windage on a Pedestoli 3 band 1853 Enfield rifle musket? Uh, I will show you that in a future video where I'm going to get more deep dive on a lot of Civil War weapons, including that one. So, apologize. I probably shouldn't have put the question in here, but I'm going to tell you that I'm working on that, and there's going to be more content about that rifled musket. So, just stay tuned, I guess. Eldos 1. Could a side gate lever action rifle have been effectively used in World War I in theory? I absolutely think, absolutely. Um, the, uh, in my opinion, yes, yes, yes. Um, the, uh, of course, we saw some limited application of the 1895 Winchester in 54R. Um, 94? 95. 1895. Sorry, guys. But, of course, we saw some limited application of that with, of course, stripper clip feed from the top in 54R on the Russian side of things. Um, that's because everyone was obsessed with full-size power battle cartridges. And... It wasn't until we saw World War II come around where the idea of an intermediate cartridge made more sense. And people were like, oh, we're not engaging out to 1,500 meters. Um, so uh, side gate lever actions can be chambered in relatively more powerful cartridges, but they have to be um, designed with the mindset of that the cartridge won't set up the cartridge in front of it from the projectile striking the primer, which means you need to have flat nose bullets or you have to have something crazy like what LaBelle did with rings around the primer, etc. Um, but also, I think, honestly, at the average engagement distances, even in World War I, um, are pistol calibers really so insufficient at those distances that they couldn't have been better used when you think about what they brought to the table for um, suppressive fire, especially when doing trench raids? Absolutely not. So would an 1873 have done something would have been invaluable in trench combat? I think it would have been. I honestly do. Um, it's conjecture, of course, and it's fun to think about history and things like that in you know, alternative venues. Um, the, uh, and again, I used a 1873 at Desert Brutality 2020, which of course is not warfare, I'm not saying it is, but the idea of lots of ammunition that can be fired as fast as you can cycle that lever and suppress the enemy and have the ability to follow up with quick shots with minimal recoil is a big deal. And that's not something you can do with pretty any of the bolt action rifles of the time and would have been a stopgap between a bolt action and what ultimately became the submachine gun and the MB-18, right? So I think they would have been very viable. Why weren't they? Military, decisions, headquarters, um, perception. I mean, it's it's no different than, yeah, volley sites. I get it. Some of these sites were volley sites. But the distances that these things were calibrated to were absurd. Um, look at the battle zero on um, on a regular a regular Gewehr 98. It's, just, it's unrealistic. Paolo C. What do you guys think about sporterizing perfectly good Milsert guns or even putting reversible stuff on them? Well, I have no issue with reversible stuff. I've done that with some of mine. I've got a Car 98 here, including a very rare Norwegian um, variant that um, have ZF-41s on them. But it's reversible. It's just part of the rear sight assembly. As long as you keep the original parts in a bag and can turn it back to its original state and you don't do damage in the process, reversible modifications to me are not an issue whatsoever. In terms of sporterizing a perfectly good Millsup SERP, I would absolutely adv advise against modifying these guns in non-reversible ways. Um, it's doing damage to a piece of history at that point. We saw a lot of this, of course, after World War II in Korea, because Millsurp weapons from the enemy were super cheap. 
and you could get them for less than you could get a newly manufactured hunting rifle. That is no longer the case. If you need something that isn't able to be achieved by owning the Milsert gun, just go down to the freaking local Big Five and buy the thing Savage off the shelf, or even Walmart if they're still doing that. I don't know. I haven't been to Walmart in a while. But any of these $350 to $400 commercial Remingtons or Savages will outshoot one of these Milsert guns anyway, and you're not destroying a piece of history. James B. You've mentioned a personal preference for the 1853 Enfield rifle musket over others of the area. What makes it superior to a Springfield, Lorenz, or any of the other percussion rifles that wasn't widespread use? Um, I actually feel it's the sights. It's almost entirely the sights. The sights on the 1861 uh, Springfield are terrible. They really are. They're almost like express sights. And the Enfield sights were fast enough that you could still use them in a dynamic environment, but also precision enough that you could make realistic hits. I have a 25-second video on this channel of me doing an offhand standing shot at 200 yards with an 1853. Um, I also think that the general fit and finish of the 1853 was better. Some of them, uh, a, a lot of them still came into this country in the white, meaning that they weren't blued. Um, 1861 Springfields are, are just in the white, which makes them not protected against the elements as well against the corrosive salts of black powder and percussion caps. So you have to really clean the heck out of an 1861 after firing it. You have to clean all these to a large degree. But the 53 is blued, etc., and has some anti-corrosive capabilities in its in its proper guise. So um, the 53 is aesthetically better, in my opinion, um, as well as the sights are better, and the fact that uh, you could get them in blued variants that are somewhat protective against the elements is just a better thing, in my opinion. Chris G., since I've moved to the American South, I noticed my black guns become unbearably hot. I can usually figure out how to deal with them with an AR-15 handguard platform, but the stocks are another thing. Are there any products out there that specifically deal with heat mitigation in regards to this? Well, yeah, one of the questions we see here on InRange all the freaking time is something Sinister Rifle came up with called the SHTF. It's a heat wrap that's got Velcro on one side, and then you just wrap it around the stock of the handguard, actually around the handguard, and that um, helps you be able to hold the handguard. You can get those at K Arms, I think. Um, as for the stock, yeah, you know it's called Krylon. Paint it. Go to the local store, get a rattle can of gray or tan or some other color that's not black and, and spray paint that thing. Um, black absolutely absorbs more heat and ultraviolet energy than other colors, which deflects some of it. And while those tan stocks will still get warm, they won't get so hot that you can't hold them. So I would rattle can it. I've done that with a lot of my um, practical guns and it makes a huge difference. Andrew D., do you think, based on the rate of fire, a, long, a squad of longbowmen could have decimated an 18th century line of redcoats, assuming the numbers on each side are equal? Wow, that's such a great piece of conjecture. Um, I've recently acquired a 1795 Springfield smoothbore musket to do some videos with here on the channel about a very interesting topic and um, messing around flintlock and smoothbore and all that. And I will tell you that getting reliable hits um, I would say even on a line of men out past 75 yards would be a really good day. Um, you can pretty much have aim fire at 50 yards if you're lucky. Closer than that's better. Can proper longbows reach that far? Yes. You kind of volley fire them, but so what? Enough of them on each side, I would argue. I would actually say that a squad of longbow men that really know what they're doing probably would have had an advantage against redcoats armed with brown besses. I really do. I know that sounds so counterintuitive, but the rate of fire and those are those and the fact that trying to reload those things while taking incoming arrows would be a problem. Um, I do think that a squad of longbow men could have actually cut down redcoats quite brutally. Mauser dude. Is your interest in Old West history and guns driven by location? If you lived in Kentucky, do you think your interest would skew more towards Daniel Boone? Um, I'm not not interested in those regions at all, actually. Um, a lot of what you see in terms of my emphasis is because I'm here. Um, and I also think that it's just this happened. There's a couple things that happened out here in this part of the country that didn't happen there as much, in that the time period and confluence of history meant that the technology was there to make these things very much more effective than, let's say, a flintlock Kentucky rifle or something like that. Um, and then as a result, you have this like crucible of different cultures and battles and conflicts that while that was going on 
in the East. Um, but when you're but when you're talking about you know 1860s and on, that was mostly west of the Mississippi or west of the Pecos even. Um, and so it's when we see this greatly increasing technology. Um, and conflict and crucibles turning into very interesting events. I still think I would have had an emphasis here versus there, although that's not to say that what happened in other regions than here aren't just as fascinating. Ghostly garbage. Is there anything fundamentally wrong with a semi-auto shotgun for home defense use, or is it just that most people prefer pump guns? There is nothing fundamentally wrong with a semi-automatic shotgun for home defense use if you've proved it with the ammunition you plan to use for that purpose. Some automatic shotguns, based on whether they're gas systems or recoil or whatever, um, can be tricky. Um, you need to make sure that the ammunition that you've loaded that gun with is reliable for the purpose that you're using it for and that that's what you're loaded with when you need it. Um, so um, I would say there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the concept as long as you've proofed it out. Anthony H. Can a zombie be knocked unconscious from being hit in the head, or are they immune to that sort of head trauma? Well, I, I believe that we've proven that the physiological effects that cause the zombies to function has to do with a still functional amygdala. And um, this is one of the things I think is wrong in a lot of the documentaries that we see today, like The Walking Dead, etc., is that just almost any head wound puts them out of commission. And so really it needs to be destruction of the central cortex and the amygdala for a zombie to go down. And I think that the documentaries and, um, and field work we're seeing represented in the mass media is doing people a disservice in the actual destruction of um, zombified human remains. So um, if you consider that it has to be destruction of the central cortex and the amygdala, I don't think that they can technically really be knocked unconscious because that typically has something to do with trauma to the external sections of the brain and not the part that's keeping a zombified human remain functional. So my answer is no, they cannot be knocked unconscious from a blow to the brain, but if you were to hit them hard enough with a bludgeon that would destroy the central cortex slash amygdala, you would have an effect of neutralizing the threat. Matt G. Without naming names or stirring up drama, oh boy, have publicly stated opinions about the pandemic and or the recent ongoing protests against police misconduct affected who you're willing to collaborate with, invite, or visit to create content with? Um, I don't know what to say to this. Uh, there are definitely people in this world that I would not work with, and there are probably definitely people in this world that won't work with me. And, okay. That's just the nature of being human beings with differences of opinions. Um, I don't know that I, I don't know that I made that many. I guess I've made a lot of studied opinions about the pandemic. Um, I think that it does show us true colors. I think we've seen uh, people that speak one thing and then do another, uh, and that is uh, sadly very consistent within a lot of our community and a lot of people in general. Like. What we say and hold up and then what we do are frequently two different things. And um, one of the things that I think we're all, we're all susceptible to making mistakes in that regard, myself included. Turns out I'm a human being. But one of the things we can hold ourselves to is consistency in terms of how we apply our beliefs. And um, I don't think we're seeing a lot of consistency from a lot of other... Uh, I don't know how to put this. Not a lot. That's not a fair term. Some of what I've seen out in the world is very much inconsistent with the stated goals of what we've seen in the past. So when things start getting weird, that's when the colors come out, right? And um, um, even if it's inadvertently. And so I have seen um, things that do not seem to be consistent with statements I've seen in the past from, from other venues. Um, that said, will um, having a difference of opinion would not prevent me from working with someone at all. Um, if they are good human beings that actually have the interest of others at heart but have a difference of opinion or approach to a topic, that is not a problem for me. That's actually a fine thing and we can sit down and have a uh, civilized, mature conversation. Um, if someone's goals are ones of maliciousness or violence or um, have some in form of um, inherent racist agenda or anti-science agenda, no, I will not work with them. Uh, why would I? Um, this is no different than having an argument with a flat earther. Um, I'm not going to have a debate with someone whose very premise comes from one of, of intentional um, ignorance. And I'm also not going to sit down and have a debate with someone who comes from a place of intentional um, 
malignment or racism or violence against others. Um, with that, uh, no. Um, Self-defense is a different thing than offense, and there are people who seem to be more interested in one than the other. And no, I would not work with someone that talks like that or speaks like that or espouses views like that. So would it change my opinion of some of the people I would work with now from what I've seen? Yes, it would. Uh, does it change my opinion of being willing to work with someone who has a differing opinion, but they still have the best interests of society and others at heart, even though we have a different way of getting to that same goal? No, it would not change my opinion of working with them. I hope that makes sense. That's a nuanced opinion, and that's a difficult question. And uh, InRange doesn't really shy away from difficult questions. And again, is you are supported. Um, these kind of things are hard to do. And being an um, alternative voice... Uh, for lack of a better term, in anything, whether it's this community or YouTube or anywhere else, is a, a hard thing to do. And um, uh, I do believe and I understand that you t that this channel has occasionally had an alternative voice or opinion. And um, that's something that, uh, and I appreciate when those things are done from places of, as I said earlier, where the best interests are at heart in the process. Alternative opinions that are there just to cause harm are of are worse than no value. Alternative opinions that are there because we care about everyone else around us in our society and our community um, are important. And uh, you'll see that people that have the um, maliciousness in their hearts will lash out at those alternative opinions in ways that are, well, it tells you a lot about them. Uh, I'm going to go to the next question. Duke Von Niep II. Most pleasant or weirdest gun smells? I got two. Got two. I really like the smell of Ballastol. I think it's neat. Um, a lot of people hate it. I love it. The other one I really like is old World War II-ish Korean era American mill syrup wooden stocks that have been soaked in linseed oil. Those just smell good. And in the original, um, one of our old M1 carbine reproduction reviews, one of the things that I chalked up as a deficiency to the reproduction is it didn't have the right smell. Because that smell, when I pick, whether I like an M1 carbine or not, eh, I love the smell. You get that old M1 Garand or M1 Garand, M1 carbine. You smell that smell, and that's just something about that smell. So the linseed-soaked old American wood guns and ballast all both are top-notch scents. Pratik. Are there any worthwhile Magnum pistol cartridge lever guns for scoped competition or home defense use? Scoped. Uh, I, uh, I when I see when I see Magnum pistol cartridge and scope, I see that as I don't get that. Um, I could see having a red dot or something for that. A pistol cartridge of that type, even a 357 Magnum, is a 200 yard or less. I don't know what you have a scope on that for. Um, you might have a red dot for quicker acquisition. Um, but I've said this quite consistently. I'm going to say it again. In my opinion, the quintessential best lever action rifle for these purposes is a 1873 chambered and 357 Magnum. Will W, how common was it to have a Derringer as a primary weapon in the Old West? Um, Derringers, I, you know, that's a hard one. Um, Derringers were around, but I don't know that I'd ever think of them as commonly primary. The most common primary weapon that you found floating around were relatively cheap um, five-shot 32 Smith & Wesson pocket revolvers. Ivor Johnson and others made them. They were like the Keltec of their day. Um, you could hide them in your pocket, and better than a Derringer that you had five shots. Uh, Derringers existed, certainly. Those were typically considered gambler guns. Um, in fact, for some reason, I think Derringers were more common on riverboats more than anything else. And I don't know why I'm saying that, except just vague memory of that. But when you think of the Old West, like in Tombstone or other places like Dodge City and etc., um, those five-shot pocket Ivor Johnson-style 32 Smith & Wesson or other cartridge revolvers were kind of the thing. And um, the reason those were the thing were twofold. One, you didn't have to walk around with a giant piece of iron on your hip. Second of all, most cities had ordinances against the open carry of firearms within city limits. Tombstone included, and the herbs are the ones that implemented those rules here. So, uh, one of those fascinating topics about people who really lionize Erp and talk about Erp, 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 Erp was this amazing guy that went and killed all the bad guys while he simultaneously, simultaneously implemented authoritarian anti-carry laws within every city that he became law enforcement with so that he could be the guy with the gun, or his friends could be. Doc Holliday frequently got caught with concealed weapons and got nothing more than a fine or nothing, while others would get beaten over the head with uh, a gun and called buffaloed because they were breaking the ordinance. Going down a, a rabbit hole here. Um, but um, that said, if you wanted to have a pistol within city limits of places that were um, non-permissive, 
those little five shot revolvers were pretty much the bag. And frankly, the Derringers are quite underpowered. I think they were chambered at what, 41 rimfire? Yeah, it'll kill you, but it, it, it's uh, pretty impotent. Hmm. All right, next one. Wow, this is a long one. Flying Millennial. What do you think is the best gun to keep in a ditch kit? Ditch kit? Something you're going to get rid of? Um, well, I don't keep my guns in a ditch, and I don't plan on ditching anything. If you're talking about a, some kind of um, self-defense gun, uh, I don't even know what to mean by this. Um, I think that a gun that you want to use to defend yourself with is one that you're competent and proficient with, and if you're putting a piece of garbage somewhere because you think that you're going to have to get to it because the apocalypse is happening, you're going to pull it out of a ditch, or you're willing to ditch it. Um, I don't know what to say to that. I don't really have any input. Juan May Z. Aside from Lewis and MP40 slash MP5, what are three other machine guns that would make your list um, and are available in the transferable marketplace? Okay, not the Lewis, MP40, or MP5. <sighs> A functional PPS H41? Absolutely. That'd be awesome. An MG34? Because that's one of the better lightweight belt-fed machine guns that you could actually still use and have some practicality with. And um, one more machine gun. God. Um, that's tough. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm kind of you gave you, you kind of took away my my options I already would have picked. Um, I don't. There's none on the transferable. I'd love a P90. But that's not transferable. That would be post sample stuff. Wow. Oh, STG44. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, that would be my answers. Helix 92. Have you seen any 6.5, 6.8, or 0.224 at a two gun match, and did they have any advantage? Funny you say that. The video coming up this week is a 6.5 Creedmoor MDR Desert Tech. Um, boop. So that's coming. Have I seen 6.8? Yes. Have I seen 2.24? I don't think so. Um, and did 6.8 have any advantages? Nope. Cutler R. Favorite book you're currently reading? I just got Audible and need new reading material for my work commute. Uh, or recently read. I'm sorry. I should. Well. Uh, Audible. Uh, I don't know if this is for you. Uh, like it, it depends on if you like the guy or not. Doug Stanhope just came out with his new audiobook. He's a comedian here in Arizona, down in um, in Bisbee, and his books are very harsh, real world views of things. Um, uh, been enjoying that, but that may not be your bag. Uh, that just came out, um, and I recently listened to William a bunch of books by William Burroughs. Re-listened. I've read read a bunch of his work, but I listened to, listened to them. I recently I listened to. Um, Junkie recently. Wow, what an interesting life story um, and uh, amazing um, slice of time and a view into a world that, uh, well, hopefully some of you that we're not necessarily directly related to. Um, so um, those are two that I've been enjoying, but I doubt that, that they know that's that's kind of oddball stuff. That's a, if you're into that or not. One that might be more um, more accessible is uh, Sawbones. Uh, a medical history to misguided medicine. They do a podcast. Their podcast is great. They have an audio book called. It's just called Sawbone. S A W B O N E S. And I actually, I probably would recommend that one. That's the one that's going to be most accessible to everyone versus the two I just mentioned. Um, give that a listen. David W. During the time when cartridge revolvers had not yet become the norm, how long could the cylinders of cap and ball revol revolvers remain loaded before reliability of ignition suffered? You know, I don't know this answer besides stuff that a friend of mine actually did to test this out. He loaded them and let them sit for a couple years, and they work just fine. Um, I think, frankly, as long as you're keeping them stored in any reasonable environment, um, properly capped and wax sealed or sealed with lubricant, indefinitely would be my answer. And the idea that black powder is just hydroscopic by and of itself by just sitting there it just absorbs water is not true. Um, the salts that are created from firing it that are corrosive is real um, but the, um, the or the corrosiveness in general I don't know if I should use the word salts uh, but black powder just sitting in a chamber or in a cartridge with wax seal and a part and a percussion cap is not attracting water or humidity. It is not in and of itself hydroscopic so it should be indefinite. Wilma E. Non-gun question. Are you beer, wine, or liquor? Liquor. 
Absolutely. Mescal and absinthe are my two go-tos. Mescal more often than not, I'm missing. Although I don't drink very much at all. Kind of rare. Aaron L. You've spoken pretty highly of the M1 Garand on several occasions, so what's the first battle rifle that you would consider overall better than the Garand? FAL? I mean, that's the next one, really. I mean, they took they took the concept and made it magazine-fed and made it reliable. I'm not a big fan of the FAL's indefinitely adjustable gas system, but a properly tuned FAL is a better battle rifle than a Garand. Eyeball. How do the following single shaft rifles compare with each other against the clock? Springfield Trapdoor, Sharps, and Remington Rolling Block. Uh, the Trapdoor will win. The Sharps, well, the Sharps and the Trapdoor, uh, Sharps, I'm assuming you mean cartridge Sharps, not paper cartridge Sharps. I would say the Trapdoor and the Sharps are going to be the faster than the Rolling Block. Um, rolling Block's a little slow because you got to go cock, cock, and then, and then uh, but the Trapdoor, when you eject it, bloop, it pops out of there, and the Sharps comes out pretty quick, too. I would say the trapdoor and the sharps are going to be just about equal. Alexander M. In your experience, is the Shield RMSC worth having on the Hellcat, or do you find yourself using the iron sights more often and ignoring the dot? Um, I find myself at very close ranges. I'm going to say something that's super controversial. Just index firing, and when I want to actually aim or need to aim, I use the dot. So um, the iron sights are good for getting you to the dot, but then using the dot for the actual aim. And if things are close enough, you don't need either. So I would say yes, you want the dot. I think you always want the dot, if you can have a dot. Brian I, choose one, full auto SMG with a controllable rate of fire, or a select fire SMG with a less controllable rate of full auto fire. Full auto only with controllable rate of fire, because you can do trigger discipline and you can get singles or doubles. Um, I don't think that select fire is all that freaking important on a, on a SMG. Eric B. What sort of ear protection do you use or recommend? Preferably one that can be worn with a hat. Um, I hate all over the ear stuff. Doesn't work. Gets bumped off. And when it gets bumped off, you then lose your hearing when you fire the next subsequent shot. Hate it all unless I'm doing something very static. Um, on the cheap end, I use typical just orange squishies, which work great and work with a hat. If you want to spend a little money, I would highly recommend something I've really found that I enjoy very much called Eargasm just like it sounds, E-A-R-G-A-S-M. You can find them on Amazon. They can go onto your keychain, and they are um, valved uh, in the ear, earplugs that work exceptionally well. Very happy with the product. So if you want to spend some money, look at the eargasms. If you want to be cheap, get a bag of orange squishies. Michael J. Uh, there are some in -range, there's some in-range content on Full30 that isn't on YouTube. Will this content ever be migrated? I would like to. Some of it I can't because it would be against YouTube policies. The problem is almost all of that content was filmed when it was all done in 480. Um, everyone now expects 1080p and some people expect 4K. And I would be glad to replicate or put up the 4K, this old 480 content, but I am not going to be glad to hear the constant comments about the low video quality. So should I? Probably. Um, do I want to hear the complaints? Not really. Jiraj H. Since you are so much unlike other gun channels, are you getting some heat or annoyance from the anti-gun community? Oh no, I don't get anything from the anti-gun community. All of the heat and annoyance I get is from the gun community. The anti-gun community, um, uh, I mean, that's not fair. Do I get stuff from the anti-gun community? Yes. There are comments that show up about you guys are all killers and murderers and everything should be banned. Those people show up. But if I think about the people that have given in-range the most trouble or the most problems, um, it's been the gun community. Just because we don't walk lockstep, or I should say maybe I, don't walk lockstep with every one of your views doesn't mean that I'm your enemy. Um, uh, at the same time, some of your views might make me your enemy, and that's acceptable if they're the views that I'm thinking of. Um, but accusations of being anti-gun and all this kind of nonsense is literally nonsense, and the people that spew that stuff are uh, idiots. Um, a number of them also have decided that they want to go after my personal life. And um, uh, I've had people try to dox me. I've had people go into my personal accounts and take, do things there. Um, they're interested in things that are not related to the channel, who are friends of mine, etc. Um, I don't know what your people's problem is, but um, you need to get a hobby. And um, if you think that this channel is not about promoting respectful, dignified, um, responsible firearms ownership for um, and rights, you are wrongly mistaken. And um, if some of my views in the world differ than yours, 
Um, that's not what this channel's about. This channel's a firearms and history channel with a cultural channel. And if you don't like this channel, I've got a super simple answer for you. Don't watch it. Just go watch something else. Man, when I look at other YouTube content creators, there's a lot of them out there that are probably well more aligned with you than me, and that's fine. Go do that. Um, so when you ask your question, have I received a lot of grief from anti-gun people? Not really. Some. I think all firearms-related content creators receive some of that. Have I received um, grief from what we would call the gun community? Yeah, a lot. And um, that tells you something about the community. In fact, you know when you hear this phrase, cancel culture? Um, that we like to throw at what we, we call the left? Um, I will say that this community is a, a huge proponent of that. Um, they, they complain about it and then do it. Um, so frequently we complain about the things that we actually do ourselves and then put it on the other. Um, and people try to do that with this. So um, this channel has a wide variety of, um, and has had and will continue to have a wide variety of co-hosts and, and invited guests who propose and have a wide variety of views and worldviews and different views on things, whether it's firearms or otherwise. And as long as I said earlier in this video, they are rational, intelligent human beings that don't have malice in their heart, and they come from a place of reasonable, logical sanity, I have no reason to not have them here, um, even if we disagree on things. So uh, that's plurality, and that's an importance of plurality, and a conversation like that matters. But there are people in the world that will take that and then turn it into or try to weaponize it as some sort of thing that it is not. And that's absurd, and those people are not our enemy, not our friends. They are enemies to not only our firearms rights, but to free speech in general. Whether they think they are doing the opposite or not, they are not helping. Levy C. Do you think that echo or binary triggers have an actual application outside of making the NFA obsolescent? I don't think they even do that. I think um, every one of these echo binary triggers I've had have been complete pieces of crap and they don't work. Um, I actually have one in an AK right now that I will do a video on because I haven't done a video on any of them and this thing sucks. Um, it's constant malfunctionville. I know people talk about, oh look, I can shoot more ammo faster. The reality is, is you can put a good um, a good match trigger in there and get a reasonable rate of fire that actually doesn't cause malfunctions. I think these uh, these binary triggers are um, at best garbage, at worst dangerous, and have no application at all whatsoever. Um, maybe you have fun with one. That's cool. I'm not trying to say you shouldn't. I have never had any of them work reliably, and I don't think they make the NFA obsolescent. They just don't. Uh, the thing that did uh, well, I don't know if it did. The thing that worked better were bump stocks, and those were, were viable for increasing the rate of fire and kind of simulating fully automatic. And, well, we all know what happened with that, don't we? Um, so let, let's put it this way. Since binary echo triggers haven't been uh, attacked, by, um, our, uh, attacked by our president and the legislature, that tells you about the viability of them for anything. Um, so... The reality is those things don't work well enough to even draw the attention of the ire of the people that want to be authoritarian gun banners. So that tells you all you need to know about the effectiveness of binary echo triggers. F fudge? F-U-D-J. Fifth time asking. Have you guys at, at InRange tested any titanium muzzle devices yet? Yes, and we're working on it, and it will be discussed in the What We're Going to Do project. David S. Second time. Does InRange get a cut from the profit of the What What's Done or Do 2020 project through Brownells or KE Arms? InRange TV does get a cut for every complete, what was complete, What What's Done or Do 2020 rifle sold through Brownells. InRange does not get anything, not one penny, from the sale of the KP-15 lower. The only cut comes from Brownells through them selling a complete What What's Done or Do 2020 rifle, not the lower. So, yes, comes from Brownells and only for the complete gun. Sam N. How ubiquitous was the 1873 Colt revolver in the Old West? It was quite ubiquitous. It was a very common gun on the frontier, and it was what a lot of people would open carry when they were out of city limits, which I mentioned earlier. You could not open carry within city limits, which made that gun not that viable to be carrying around in town because it's kind of big and huge. But the idea that they were one of the more common or more popular weapons was true, although there were others as well that had been forgotten as a result of the perceived popularity of the Colt Single Action Army. As with all things militarily adopted, they get more attention than others. The um, Colt Single Action Army was adopted by the U.S. government as its sidearm, and therefore it became 
I don't know if they're for, but it definitely increased the popularity of it within civilian circles as well. There are other revolvers that are fantastic from the time period that you just don't hear or see much about because they are not the Colt Single Action Army that was as adopted by the U.S. government. And that said, the Colt Single Action Army was absolutely uh, quite popular within the Old West. Aaron H., second time asking, have you ever shot matches professionally, paid to participate in a match? No, I've never been paid to participate in a match. I have occasionally shot a few what are called sponsored slots, in which someone paid for a slot for someone to shoot in the match, and I was provided a sponsored slot, and I shot the match for free, not, not ammunition, mind you, just got a slot in the match. That has happened. But I have, ever, have I ever received a check for shooting in a match? No. Last question. Ryan, what is the best, worst gun you've ever had the misfortune of shooting? Hmm, best, worst gun. The name's evading me right now. I can't remember. I, it, brain fart. But the, the German blow-forward pistol that feels like you're shooting a Magnum when you're just shooting a standard little cartridge. That thing's cool. Um, I don't... I, I know what it is. I just can't think of the name of it. That was I really like that. And uh, would I consider it a viable gun that I would uh, recommend? No. Was it fun to shoot just because it was this weird blow forward thingy? Yeah. So is it a bad gun? Yeah. Was it fun to shoot? Yeah. Is it weird mechanically? Yeah. So that's the one. I'm sorry the name's evading me right now. It's been a while, but I've always wanted to get one of those, and just they're not worth the money that they that they're that they're worth in the collector market. But just being weird and blow forwards, quote cool, cool. So that'd be my answer. And that was the last question for this particular Q and A. Again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, if you're interested in be uh, wanting to be able to put your questions into the hat, um, that does come to our Patreon supporters at the right Patreon support level. And if you already are one. Thank you so much. If I did not get your question, please submit it again next month and then list that I did not get to it. And as you saw, there are some here that have been in the queue for a while, but I will finally get to them if I can. And so just keep marking fifth, third, second time, whatever, and we'll get there. There's a lot of questions and I can't get to them all. This is already an over an hour long video. Um, but I appreciate each and every one of you keeping this channel alive because it's you, the viewer, again, that'll make in range survive. There is no monetization from anywhere else. And so that said, there's going to be new stuff coming. we got some content coming about blunderbusses, which is something I've always been interested in, and shotguns, so that'll happen. Ooh, there's a shotgun back there. You might recognize that one. So, guys, thank you for keeping this channel alive, because um, I don't want to have corporate overlords. Screw that. I would like to have the viewer decide if this channel should be here with what we have sometimes called the PBS model. I also have some other support models coming soon. I can't announce them until I can. So if you do have some sort of issue with Patreon, which I will say that Patreon's been excellent to in-range, let me just say that. But if Patreon's not your bag, there's some other options coming soon, so stay tuned for that. Uh, I want to thank you for that, and I want to thank you for watching this whole thing. If you can't be a supporter, I totally get it. Just please share with your friends. Um, share in range with people you think would be appropriate for this alternative voice in the community. And um, thanks for watching. I really appreciate all of you. Stay tuned.